Okay. All right, we're good to go. Excellent. All right. Well, thank you everybody for joining us. This is very exciting to see so many um, names. I wish we could see everybody's faces, but um, you know, with the current circumstances and also hopefully the next time we give some kind of workshop or presentation, it might be in person. But I want to jump right in because I want to save as much time as possible for myself and for Sydney Ross to speak and then mostly to have some questions at the end because I feel like that's where we're going to have some great discussion. So I'm going to talk really quick about some basic housekeeping. I think most people have experienced Zoom or Microsoft Teams or some sort of platform over this last year. So I think everybody is relatively familiar, but your microphones have been muted. However, your cameras have not been turned off. So if you still have them on, please go ahead and turn them off just to minimize distraction. Um, at the end, there is gonna be time for questions like I just mentioned. So if you have a question during our presentations, go ahead and type it in the chat box and Tara Moore, our moderator, she will be keeping an eye on those. And then she will, um, bring those back up at the end of our presentations. I'm also going to have a slide with contact information for myself and for Sydney at the very end. So you can jot down that information if you have any other questions that you'd like to send us after this webinar has ended. And then finally, we are recording this and we're going to post it on our NC Pollinator Conservation Alliance YouTube channel, hopefully in less than a week. And if you have registered for this, which you have because you're all on here, then I'm going to send an email out through Eventbrite letting you know when that recording is available. So keep an eye out for that. So just briefly, before we get into our presentations, I wanna give a little background on our organization, the North Carolina Pollinator Conservation Alliance. We are a partnership of 27 agencies and organizations across the state. We all have interest in pollinator conservation and outreach. We have six committees listed here below, plant resources, outreach, habitat assessment, research, energy, and pesticide stewardship. So these webinars that we've been hosting are through our outreach committee. And I would say that that's really a huge bulk of what we do. You know, there are so many different organizations in the state, so it can be confusing to go to one entity and get some guidance or some input and then go to another organization and get some Thing a little bit different. So the hope of this partnership is to really send a unified message of, of pollinator conservation. And so it's our hope to do this today in this webinar. This is our website, pollinator, ncpollinatoralliance.org. Head to that site, check us out. We're still building it, so give us a little bit of grace and patience. We're also on social media on uh, Facebook and Twitter and Instagram. And then, like I mentioned, we have a lot of partners. So this is just a really brief glance at some of the partners or most of the partners that we work with. We're so fortunate. We have a really diverse group of organizations that have so much expertise and knowledge that really make this group move forward and accomplish a lot of great things. So just a really quick glance at our agenda. Sydney Ross, she is gonna kick us off and talk about Mosquito Management 101, everything that you need to know about mosquitoes and their management. And then I'm going to end our webinar talking about just some basic pollinator biology, as well as some pesticide-free um, mosquito management alternatives. So these are our speakers. Like I said, Sydney, she'll kick it off. My name is Gabriella Garrison. I will end the webinar. And we have Tara Moore from the Wildlife Federation keeping an eye on our chat. So that is all I have. Sydney, if you wanna go ahead, let me stop sharing. Sydney, if you wanna, take over and then we'll get this show on the road. Cool. Well, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. Can you, can everybody hear me okay? And from here. All right, can we uh, see it all right? Is it in the presenter view or are we in notes view? Um, you, if you go, it's not in present view yet. It's still in the outline view. Okay, so we're in the same the same thing that happened to us earlier. But click, if you on, go, click on the from beginning all the way to the left. Yep. I have it up that way now, but it seems to just want to do the notes view. Let me try to stop sharing and then I'll try to share again just from beginning and see if it will work. Okay, it's not coming up that way. One second. Yeah. 
I'm gonna make our share screen. Okay, can you see it all right? Or is, it's good? Good, I see some nodding. So we'll go ahead and get started. So uh, thank you for that nice introduction, Gabriella. Um, my name is Sydney Ross. I work for the North Carolina Department of Agriculture's Pesticides section. Um, I did notice that we do have quite a few people on here who are not in North Carolina. So I wanted to kind of give a precursor that all of the, you know, kind of things that I mentioned here in terms of our enforcement and our laws and regulations are going to be specific to North Carolina. This is not um, information that's going to be broadband on a kind of federal regulatory level. So do make sure to kind of note that the laws and regulations um, that I'm going to briefly touch on are going to be specific to us here in North Carolina. In terms of um, kind of what I do for the state, so um, our department regulates pesticides in um, North Carolina, and specifically, um, I kind of act as our pesticide operations specialist, which means that I answer all of the complaint calls related to outdoor use of pesticides in the state, and then we'll go ahead and kind of delegate those um, complaints out to our inspectors if let's say we need to further investigate, which means that I also kind of manage our case files and things like that. Um, so that's gonna be kind of the standpoint from which I'm speaking today. And I'll go ahead and try to slide, go to the next one here. So in terms of what we're talking about, um, I'm gonna give you kind of a um, sort of broad, I'd say spectrum picture here of what happens in the mosquito industry. My goal through this presentation is to arm you with knowledge so that if you do, let's say, kind of run across a mosquito application, you understand the type of equipment that they use, the standpoint from which um, the commercial mosquito industry does control. And then we're also gonna kind of go into specifically um, a little bit about the types of products that are used so that you're familiar with the types of products that are used commonly in the mosquito industry. And I'm going to um, also kind of touch a little bit about the different types of applications that happen and the types of applicators. We're going to talk a little bit about IPM and the types of control. We're also going to talk about how applicators choose a product. We'll touch on pesticide labels and toxicity. And then finally, I'm going to give you um, a little bit of a picture of kind of how our state regulates mosquito applicators. So starting off here, we're going to keep it really broad, like I said. So what is a pesticide? So a pesticide is any substance or mixture of substances intended for preventing, destroying, repelling, or mitigating a pest. And you'll notice here that I've kind of uh, taken this from our North Carolina pesticide law, which is kind of where we derive our sort of basic laws for pesticide regulation in our state. And I also think it's important to note here that pesticide is an umbrella term. So a lot of times when we say pesticide, we're thinking an insecticide, we're thinking something that kills an insect, but pesticide is actually a sort of a broad term that kind of is like I had mentioned. So any type of product that mitigates, repels, kills a pest. So a pest could be a weed, it could be, you know, a bacteria, it could be a fungus. And also make a note here too that pest is subjective. So for example, if let's say you have a pollinator garden and you know you specifically planted red clover so that um, the bees will come and forage on that plant, there are other people, especially for example, people in the golf course industry who might say, oh no, that clover is actually a weed. So they'll apply an herbicide or some type of a pesticide to get rid of it. And there are a few things, of course, that are included in this definition that are not just kind of our insecticides, herbicides, fungicides. We also have plant regulators. These um, kind of regulate the growth of plants, defoliants, desiccants, um, bactericides. So anytime you use Clorox bleach, that is actually a pesticide. So just good things to kind of note here. In terms of what our section does, we have two um, specific sections within the Structural Pest Control and Pesticides Division. Um, we have a whole entire section that deals with indoor use of pesticides. Um, so this is gonna be focused more on termites, extermination, things like that. And then we also have a section, our pesticide section, which is who I work for, that deals with um, outdoor use of pesticides. You may be wondering where do our laws come from? 
earlier I had mentioned the North Carolina Pesticide Law of 1971. Um, this was brought in through um, the General Assembly in 1971, and it's a place where a lot of our laws kind of stem from. So we have kind of the way that our department functions, how people get certified, things like that is kind of built into this law. And of course, this does occasionally get revised and changed. But in terms of our violations, these actually come from the North Carolina Administrative Code's um, Food and Drug Section Subchapter 9L, which is sort of their specific regulations to the pesticide section. So this is where a lot of our regulations come from. In terms of kind of the other functions of our department, we do um, field monitoring. So um, every pesticide applicator within the state gets inspected by our inspectors. Um, we also do um, licensing of these and, um, applicators. And beyond that, we register pesticides. Normally, if we were in person, I'd tell somebody to shoot a hand up and ask, how many pesticides do you think are actually registered each year within our state? Um, since we don't have that option today, I'll just tell you that it's about um, 13,000 pesticides get registered each year within the state of North Carolina. So as you can imagine, this is kind of covering a broad array of different types of pesticides, and, and we kind of see everything from the kind of most toxic, conventional sort of pesticides all the way to our more natural or 25 feet type products, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit too. Um, as I mentioned earlier, our inspectors do perform routine and random inspections at all different types of locations. Before I was moved into the office, I was an inspector out in the field for almost three years um, and kind of covered the commercial sector. So talking to landscapers, non-licensed retail outlets, pesticide dealers, things like that, municipalities. But then we also have some inspectors that do, of course, go to farms, nurseries, greenhouses, and those larger growing operations. Um, finally, in terms of pollinator protection, which I think is why most of us are here today, um, our department manages the field watch program, which is a way for beekeepers and people with specialty crops to go ahead and register their hives or their specialty sites to a map so that people who apply pesticides can kind of mitigate drift. And now we're kind of getting here into why we're actually here today, which is for mosquitoes. So um, the first thing I wanted to do is kind of give you a brief overview of mosquito biology. That way we understand the insect that we're talking about. So mosquitoes go through complete metamorphosis. What this means is that they go from their egg stage into um, several larval stages to ultimately become a pupa and then pupate into an adult. Um, there's also incomplete metamorphosis in which um, the insect kind of goes through nymphal stages that look exactly like the adult. In terms of, you know, the amount of eggs that our mosquitoes lay, it really depends on the species. But sometimes, and I'd say broadly, it's between 40 and 100 eggs per egg cluster. And of course, the females are responsible for laying those eggs. Once the eggs kind of hatch out, they develop into the four larval stages that I have pictured up here. And another important thing to note about mosquitoes is that most species, if not all of them, do require water to survive. So that's why we kind of hear water as a really essential part of um, development of the mosquito. In terms of our most common species in North Carolina, that would be the Asian tiger mosquito or, um, and I might butcher this, so I'm very sorry, but um, Adeus um, alp. Albopictus, I think we um, didn't do the best job there and I do apologize, um, but that would be our most common species. And overall in North Carolina, it's common to see about three or four different species of mosquito, but I didn't go ahead and list all of the names out here, just kind of wanted to give you the most common one that our mosquito applicators kind of focus on. And um, in terms of, you know, who we're actually targeting when we talk about, you know, mosquitoes being a nuisance or let's say a um, viral infection type of insect, we're actually targeting that adult mosquito. Our male mosquitoes are really only there for the purposes of reproduction. A lot of times they actually are kind of feeding on sort of the nectar of flowers or other, you know, type of smaller arthropods, things like that. So really it's adult mosquitoes that we're kind of looking to target when we're talking about mosquito control. There are a few different types of groups that make mosquito applications. Of course, we have our homeowners. These are going to be individuals who, you know, might be concerned about mosquitoes as a nuisance at the place where they live. 
And then we also have our public health departments or municipalities who will maybe apply mosquito control as a routine sort of process as part of their employment or after a natural disaster. And then finally, we also have our commercial applicators. So these are going to be individuals that have been hired to perform a service. In this case, it would be to apply mosquito control type products um, for compensation on somebody else's property. Um, within North Carolina, we have two different types of commercial applicators, our structural pest control, as well as our outdoor mosquito um, type of applicators. So I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about those as well, but just know that we kind of have two categories in which mosquito applicators commercially fall into. In terms of our homeowners, of course, there's going to be uh, many different types of control that we see. So there's things like using personal repellents. So this could include, I'm sure most of you are familiar with DEET. Um, it also could be, you know, that individuals will wear permethrin treated clothing, or they're using maybe a more natural, what we call a 25B product. So this is a natural quote unquote type pesticide that doesn't require formal pesticide registration because it has sort of a less harmful type ingredient. Also kind of common in the sort of homeowner sphere, um, we have area-wide repellents like citronella candles or diffusers, um, granular insecticides, um, specifically larvicides. I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that in the future as well. Um, or insect growth regulator products. So um, homeowners, homeowners are very common to kind of use mosquito dunks or try to treat areas where larval mosquitoes might kind of be hiding and hanging out. And then apart from that, um, also, you know, we have the kind of cultural methods of control. And Gabrielle is gonna talk a little bit about this in more depth, but, you know, kind of reducing standing water or cleaning out gutters where standing water might be present. Um, one thing to note here is um, homeowners do not require a license to make pesticide applications within the state of North Carolina. I get this call all the time, you know, my neighbor is outside spraying for mosquitoes, does he need to have a license? No, he does not. Um, so it is important to kind of note this. Um, of course, our commercial applicators do require a license, but we'll get to that here in just a little bit. Um, and the other thing kind of to note that I always try to mention throughout these presentations is that, you know, if you do try to treat your house yourself, please make sure that you read the pesticide label. Um, labels are incredibly important to follow if you're going to be using any type of pesticide product, whether or not it's a mosquito applicator, you know, type product, or if it's something you're, you're applying to your pet. So do make sure to read the pesticide label. For our municipal applicators, um, we have, as I had mentioned, about two different types of applications that will happen on a municipal basis. So this is going to be most likely um, city, town, or county employees who either have public health programs or they're going to be applying on the basis of a natural disaster that has occurred. A lot of times you'll notice that um, when somebody is a mosquito applicator for the county, um, they're going to be using products that are either in a backpack sprayer, a fogger, or on a truck mounted sprayer. The truck mounted sprayer is very common, especially on the eastern side of North Carolina near the coast. Um, most of the time, if there is sort of a routine public health type of application, um, a lot of times they're gonna be using something like a mosquito dunk in areas that they you know, know that need to be treated that aren't necessarily somebody's property, but kind of public right of way or kind of public lands or parks where they're going to be making these applications with a backpack sprayer or a fogger. And again, that kind of public land. It is important also to note here that um, our municipal applicators do require a license with us for them to be making legal applications. That's another question that I get fairly often. And apart from that, you know, the reason why we kind of have these types of applications occurring is because, you know, they oftentimes are less of a nuisance, which is kind of where the commercial applicator comes in, but more so to reduce virus pressure. So from a public health standpoint, they're looking to reduce the number of mosquitoes so that they can also thereby reduce the amount of affected cases that they might have within that county. 
And then we're kind of moving on here to sort of the thing that we're going to focus on the most in this presentation, which is commercial applicators. So of course, our commercial applicators do require to have a certification with our department. Um, they can either be certified, like I had mentioned earlier, through our structural pest control department or through our pesticide section. Um, they are required to abide by all legal requirements. It's a violation of the law if they do not. Um, and this includes, you know, wearing the perfect type of PPE that is specified on the label, um, the specific rate that they're using, applying to the correct use site, these types of things. And it's also important to note here that um, they cannot be applying mosquito products to blooming flowers. Um, this is something that we get questions about all the time. Um, if there are pollinators visiting blooming flowers in your yard, they should not be applying mosquito applications to those areas. It's going to be on the pesticide label for most of these products. So do be sure to check out the pesticide label, which for us in North Carolina is a lot of where we derive our pesticide regulations from. Um, most of the time, you know, our applicators are going to be out there from 8 to 5 p.m. So they are working a normal work day. So it's important to kind of also note this as well. And remember too, that these individuals are hired to perform a pesticide service. So if let's say, you know, you're looking for somebody to talk to when it comes to kind of trying to stop that application, um, always talk to your neighbor because again, they're out there hired to make these types of pesticide applications. From the standpoint of integrated pest management, which is kind of the way that we like to look at the pest control system as a whole, there's a few different ways in which mosquito control can be viewed. The first is biological control, so using predators or parasitoids to kind of predate the pest to infect. In this case, a bat would be a great example. We also have physical control, so in order not to kind of be bit by mosquitoes, individuals can employ physical control by just wearing extra layers, long sleeves, long pants. We have our cultural control, which is kind of changing the physical conditions around the pest to ultimately provide control. And then we also have chemical control, which would be pesticide, or in this case, maybe essential oil based. Our cultural control, and as I had mentioned, uh, Gabriella is definitely going to cover this in greater depth. But just to kind of give you a jumping off point, um, cultural controls are practices that reduce pest establishment, reproduction, dispersal, and survival based, by, based on changing the environment of the pest. So for example, if let's say you were in a vineyard and you noticed that all of the vines um, that were right next to a very dusty road were very deeply infested with spider mites. And you noticed that there was far more pest pre pressure on the mites that were, or excuse me, on the vines that were closer to the road versus the ones in the middle of the field. You may have identified that a car driving down the road kind of blew those mites up onto the vines. And that's the reason why we're having a higher pest pressure there. So in order to kind of reduce this press pressure, you decided to pave the road. Paving the road would be a form of cultural control. So again, you're kind of changing the environment. Chemical control, of course, on the other hand, is going to be an application of a pesticide in order to kill, reduce, repel, or mitigate that pest. For mosquitoes, um, these products can be li liquid or granular, but mostly they're applied as a liquid. Um, we also have, you know, contact or residual treatment. So for a lot of these products that I'm going to show you, they will kill on contact or they actually will be applied to that area and then kind of stick around for a while killing as a re residual treatment. You'll also notice that many companies will apply um, with an ultra low volume or ULV spray, which basically means that they kind of put that chemical into a fogging device, which disperses them as a very fine droplets or fog. They do this in order to kind of target that mosquito inside of the areas where they might just be kind of waiting to find um, the next area where they're going to feed on. So a lot of times they'll just kind of hang out in bushes. And so that's why they're gonna go out there and kind of fog those areas. We have uh, two different types of chemical control that can be used. We have our insect growth regulators and our insecticides. These would be kind of widely the two ca categories I'd classify them in. So for our insect growth regulators, these will actually um, kill the insect by disrupting the hormone system inside of the insect. Examples of these would be methoprene or pyroperoxifen. 
And then we also have our sort of more normally formulated insecticides. So we have adulticides, which are intended to kill adult mosquitoes, either on contact or by residual, like we just talked about, through sprays or fogging. And then we also have larvicides. So these are going to be insecticides that work by killing mosquito larvae so that they can't grow into the adult phase. You also could be wondering, you know, why is it that mosquito applicators choose to apply a specific product? There's a lot of things that will go into a management decision of a mosquito applicator, but generally the biggest reason is cost. You know, how long is it going to take them to, you know, actually make that application and how much does the chemical cost? Um, of course, they're also going to consider things like, is there a lot of standing water that should be treated? Is there a large amount of vegetation? What time of year is it? And how large is that area? Because again, ultimately this will kind of play in to the overall cost that it takes them to kind of go out there and make those applications. I had touched on it briefly before, but most of our kind of, I'd say, uh, gardeners or people who are just informed about pesticides are familiar with the safety data sheet, previously known as the MSDS or material safety data sheet. This will kind of give you information about the properties of the chemical. It might talk to you a bit about toxins ecology and how to respond if let's say there was a spill or an emergency. What a lot of people don't realize is that a pesticide label, which is actually that um, sort of informational box, um, as you can see here, I have a picture um, that's right on the front, front of the package. That's actually going to give you almost all of the information that you need for that application. Um, not only that, but it is sort of a law abiding document. In North Carolina, we like to say that the label is the law. So what that means is that anytime that you purchase a chemical or an applicator purchases a chemical, they need to adhere to that label as if it is the law because of the way that our regulations kind of work in the state. If you are going to be, you know, just kind of arming yourself again with information, always check to see you know, what product is it that they're using. Find out what the EPA registration number is because this will tell you that specific chemical formulation. And then using the product name and the EPA registration number, you can pull up the pesticide label and you can print it out to look at you know, important sections like environmental hazards, precautionary statements, and you know, kind of consider pollinator protection while you are reading that pesticide label. I didn't really include it in this presentation, but some insecticides that are a little bit more detrimental will also have a be advisory box. So um, if let's say an insecticide is identified to be a harm to pollinators, they will put a really large section in the label that says, this product is harmful to pollinators, please take the following precautions. So if you ever see a be advisory box on the label, you know that it might be one that's more harmful to pollinators. This is kind of the meat and potatoes of our presentation here. So this slide I would say is probably the most important one that we're going to look at today. And I'm very happy to kind of share this information with you as well. Um, this is a list of commonly used active ingredients for mosquito products. This, this list is not exhaustive. So just, you know, make sure that you don't think that this is the entire list, but um, I did try to go ahead and kind of put down product names for all of these active ingredients, just as examples. Within the neonicotinoid family, um, we have some imidacloprid-based products. I would say those are kind of the main ones that are used for mosquito control. Um, we also have our pyrethroids category, which is going to be the most commonly used type of active ingredient or um, sort of, I guess, type of pesticide, pesticide family that you see being used in mosquito control. Um, what these are, you'll hear sometimes that pyrethrins are sort of that natural chemical protection that a chrysanthemum or plants within the chrysanthemum family use. Um, pyrethroids are the synthesized sort of synthetic version of a pyrethrin. Bifenthrin is definitely the most common one that you see, but there are of course other ones including um, permethrin, lambda cyhalothrin, deltamethrin, cyfluthrin, things like that. We do have a few organophosphates that are used occasionally for mosquito control. This includes malathion or nalid or dibrome concentrate. I see this one used sometimes in a municipal capacity. 
And then beyond that, we also have our insect growth regulators. So s uh, which is an alpicid, and then pyroperoxifen, which is an duraflex. And then we do have some bacterial larvicides as well, or what we like to call kind of biopesticides. So this would include um, Bacillus thuringiensis-based products and also um, spinosad. I know sometimes you can kind of find those in the garden section as well. I wanted to kind of briefly just give you an overview of some of the more commonly used mosquito products that um, we kind of see being used either in the homeowner sphere or in the commercial sphere. The first one I wanted to touch on is mosquito dunks. And um, what these are, are a sort of Bacillus thuringiensis granular larvicide that works by killing mosquito larva in standing water. Um, you pretty much will look at the area square footage um, and people will go ahead and kind of treat the area based off of the square footage of standing water that they have. They are um, kind of labeled as being relatively non-toxic disease, but they can affect the larva of some other species. I saw some um, comments kind of pop up in the chat box earlier as well. Um, this is a product that I think might kind of cover what it is that those sort of chat box comments were talking about. Um, this is one of our kind of more commonly used in the commercial sphere sort of organic or essential oil um, products. And this is called Essentia IC3. Again, this is just kind of an example. So if let's say somebody was to request the more natural mosquito spray, this is something that an applicator would probably use. Um, these have active ingredients like rosemary oil, geranol, peppermint oil. So again, are essential oil based. They're oftentimes kind of used as a fogger and they're kind of advertised as safe to use in high human traffic or pet traffic areas. If let's say there is a commercial mosquito application happening near you, I can guarantee you that if you're in North Carolina, most likely they're using bifenthrin. They're probably going to be using bifenthrin IT just because it's kind of the cheapest as well as um, the most effective quote unquote broad spectrum insecticide. Um, so this is the one that we see all the time during our complaint calls. Um, this is applied as a residual spray to outdoor areas and it's advertised as having up to three months of control. So you can see why commercial applicators might choose this. It kind of works by disrupting the insect's nervous system, um, which kind of puts them into a weakened state and ultimately causes death. Very similarly, we also have another product, which is called Talstar P Professional Insecticide. It is very similar to bifenthrin in that it also, or sorry, bifen IT, in which it also kind of contains 7.9% of bifenthrin as the active ingredient. It's a little bit more expensive, so it's not used as commonly, but again, it is kind of a broad spectrum insecticide that advertises residual control. I did want to kind of throw this one up here as well because we do occasionally see it being used. This is again an insect growth regulator product um, that's based with um, S. methoprene. I mentioned it earlier when we were on our active ingredient slide. Um, this one is specifically a granular formulation of this product. So it would be applied to areas where mosquito larva reside, so into kind of standing water and it advertises control up to 28 days. So it's very similar to our sort of mosquito dunks. However, it uses an insect growth regulator instead of a sort of bioinsecticide or that Bacillus thuringiensis. And it kind of has a bit of an advertised longer capacity for control. You may have noticed that in this presentation, which I do apologize, I'm trying to go very quickly because I know I'm already over my time here, but I didn't really talk to you at all about toxicity. The reason why is because um, I'm actually an enforcement specialist, so I don't have a degree in toxicology, but if let's say you're in North Carolina and you are interested in speaking to a toxicologist, we do have one on staff. If you are not in North Carolina and you're interested in speaking to a toxicologist, and this would be about questions like risk assessment, um, how a chemical might affect your health or the health of your pets or just the environment. That would be kind of um, the type of thing I'm talking about when I'm mentioning toxicology. You can also talk to the National Pesticide Information Center or NPIC, and I went ahead and kind of put their website up there and their phone number, but you could always call our department as well and we can kind of direct you over to them if we need to.
The last thing that I wanted to kind of um, put up for you here today is our pesticide toxicity to bees traffic light. What this is, is a list of um, pretty much all of the active ingredients that are used um, and how they interact with bees. Like a traffic light, the areas that are red are going to be the most toxic bees, as well as those that are kind of moderately toxic and relatively non-toxic. I've went through and kind of highlighted a few specific areas. Um, the first one that I wanted to mention, because I mentioned it a few times throughout this presentation, is bifenthrin. You will notice that it is highly toxic. Um, it is an insecticide, so it is highly toxic um, to bees, um, specifically this active ingredient. We also touched on imidacloprid, which um, again is a neonicotinoid, also, um, or sorry, I do apologize, imidacloprid, which is a fungicide, and it is again highly toxic. Um, some of the other products that are up here, you'll notice um, the pyrethrins um, are up here listed in the highly toxic section as well, as well as spinosad. So even though spinosad is kind of advertised as more of a bioinsecticide, it is still um, kind of highly toxic to be so a good thing to note here. I did throw up a few other ones as well. One of the ones that I um, had mentioned earlier is Bacillus thuringiensis, or what's kind of in mosquito dunks. These are relatively non-toxic, as well as diclot dipromide or NALID, which is sometimes used in a municipal capacity, which is again, kind of relatively non-toxic. Um, in case you were wondering, this was uh, created by our old division toxicologist who now kind of works for the EPA in case you're thinking, where did this information come from? Finally, the last thing I'm going to touch on here very quickly is who regulates the use of mosquito products. Um, as I had mentioned previously, our structural pest control section, as well as our, our pesticide section, regulate the use of mosquito products. So they are kind of doubly regulated. Um, for structural applicators, they have to have what's known as a P phase or household pest control. And then for outdoor pesticide applicators, they have to have a public health category on their license to apply for mosquitoes. And um, it is kind of important again to remember that if let's say you rent or own a property, you do not require a license to make those types of applications. Um, sometimes I get the question of how exactly do we regulate mosquito companies? I'm very quickly running out of time, so I won't get into it really, really in depth. But if let's say we receive a complaint call, we'll go ahead and send out an inspector and they will kind of check out the situation. From there, um, if let's say a violation is identified, then that um, situation will turn into an investigation. Our um, inspector will file an investigation report. And then from there, some violations are assigned so that we can actually figure out what laws were violated. Um, these are assigned by our field staff supervisors as well as an attorney from DOJ. Once the violations have been assigned, we'll create a settlement agreement. Most of the time, our cases are kind of settled out of formal court or formal hearing. And so we will kind of settle them through a settlement agreement with that applicator who sort of violated the law. If let's say that applicator accepts the settlement agreement amount, then it'll go to the pesticide board, which is a group of seven individuals sort of appointed by the governor from the pest control industry or the pesticide agriculture industry at large. Um, who will kind of make decisions and see if they agree with the settlement agreement. Once that happens, if let's say that settlement agreement is approved, then the issue will be resolved. That is pretty much all I have for you today. I covered a very wide breadth of topics, not in great depth, so I do want to apologize. I'm very happy to kind of answer your questions the best I can. And I also gave a presentation previously that was very similar to this one, but it had about an hour's length in time. So there is a video recording of that presentation as well, if you'd like to hear me go into a bit more depth about these topics that we covered today. But I'll have you go ahead and save your questions till the end and kind of pass the baton over to Gabriella. Let me see if I can stop sharing here. Okay, let me share mine. All righty, can everybody see that? Okay, let me get it into slideshow. Excellent, all right. I am going to try to speed through mine a little bit so that we have plenty of time for questions. So 
Um, my name is Gabriella Garrison. I am the Eastern Piedmont Habitat Conservation Coordinator for the Wildlife Resources Commission, which is our state wildlife agency. And before I start talking about some alternatives for mosquito management that are safe for pollinators, I just want to really quickly touch on pollinator diversity in North Carolina. So we have over 550 species of native bees, over 2,800 species of moths, probably a lot more than that, actually, that we're just not aware of. 177 species of butterflies, one bird, our hummingbird, and really this huge unknown number of other insect pollinators to include wasps and beetles and flies and all kinds of different things that we just don't take notice of. So I'm bringing this to your attention just so everyone is aware that there's so much activity going on in areas that we just don't see wherein the pesticide from mosquito spraying can get to and harm so many beneficial insects. So, um, you know, one of our most important pollinators are native bees. And so they come in a range of size and shape and colors, um, foraging habitat, uh, foraging habits and nest behavior. So this poster on the right is really one of my most favorite posters because it really illustrates that diversity, the color and the shape where they carry pollen, so on and so forth. Um, and so bees are, native bees are actually descended from wasps. A lot of people call them vegetarian wasps. They gather pollen to feed their young, whereas wasps will collect insects to feed their young. And so when they are feeding their young, they uh, create this pollen ball, which is a combination of nectar and pollen. And the nectar provides the carbohydrates and amino acids, and the pollen provides the proteins and lipids. And so in an effort just to keep going through, I wanted to really make a point of showing the life cycle of a bee so that people understand where these bees are living. So most of our bees are solitary and most of our solitary bees are ground nesters. And so this picture up here is of a female bee most likely foraging on a flower, collecting pollen and nectar. And so she has a little tunnel here underground that she excavates, that she creates, and she drops this pollen ball that I was just talking about. Well, on this pollen ball, she lays an egg, and the egg grows or transforms into a larva, which transforms into a pupa. And then over time, usually a year or so, give or take the species, that pupa will become an adult and will emerge, and then the cycle starts all over. So this is a really cool diagram because it illustrates this complex sometimes system of underground tunnels. You see each little individual tunnel has its own pollen ball. Um, I thought this was a great diagram because it compares it to wasps because a lot of times folks, when they see bees emerging from the ground, they think that they're actually wasps, which is quite the contrary. However, wasps do also are, um, live in the ground as well. So this picture on the right is what it might look like if you see some solitary bees that are hanging out in the ground that have their nests in the ground. They like to, even though they're solitary, they like to live in aggregations. And so a lot of times you'll see bees swarming the surface and they are often solitary bees. So what about the other 30%? 70% are ground nesters. Well, the other 30% are cavity and stem nesters. And those are, for example, our carpenter bees, Bumblebees will tend to find a little hidey hole, an abandoned rodent burrow. Sometimes you'll find bumblebees in a bird box. Um, they're very opportunistic. Leafcutter bees, they will nest in hollow stems. Um, mason bees, the same. That's where a lot of people put out bee boxes to attract those mason bees and leafcutter bees. And then this is the life cycle of a bumblebee. So like I mentioned, um, they will find a little hidey hole in the ground. You'll see the queen buzzing around in the spring. She's collecting pollen and nectar to create her colony, to start her colony. Um, and over time in the spring and early summer, she'll start laying more eggs um, that will feed on the pollen and nectar that she's been collecting. They will become workers. And then eventually in the fall, the workers will die off. A new queen will be formed. She'll overwinter by herself and then she'll emerge the following spring. So again, oftentimes they nest in little holes underground or right at the surface, but sometimes they are in bird boxes. So the message is that they can really be anywhere. Bees can be anywhere. It's amazing. So since I talked about the life cycle of bees, just a quick touch on the life cycle of butterflies. Um, this is a, a cycle of a monarch. Everybody is familiar with the monarch, I think. She will lay her eggs, usually on the underside of a leaf, like this picture here. The egg will hatch into a larva that we lovingly know as a caterpillar. 
the caterpillar will eat the leaves. So that's something to remember for later when we're talking about spraying on flowers. Well, what about spraying on the leaves where all the caterpillars live? The caterpillars will um, transform into a pupa, into a chrysalis, which I think a lot of folks recognize these pictures here. And then the pupa will eventually transform into an adult. So the importance of pollinators. Well, um, agriculturally speaking, we would have a much different looking produce section if we didn't have pollinators. So the image on the left is our image with pollinators and the image on the right is without pollinators. And these are some of the products that were removed. So I think most people can relate to something on this list that they eat. Um, and in fact, in other countries across the globe, they have lost so many pollinators that they have to go out and hand pollinate crops themselves because they don't have the bees to do it. So we know that they're incredibly important to um, our agricultural industry, but what about the importance of pollinators to wildlife? So almost 80% of flowering plants rely on pollinators. And as an example, cherries, which are in the genus Prunus, 84 species of birds feed on their fruits, 40 species of mammals feed on the plant parts, while 456 species of butterflies and moths rely on this genus alone for larval host habitat. Another example, dogwoods, 93 species feed on the droops, 20 species of mammals at least feed on the droops and other plant parts, and 118 species of butterflies and moths rely on dogwoods as larval host habitat. So there are a whole host of other examples of these species that are so important to wildlife that rely on pollination. So I was walking in my woods a couple of months ago when it was winter and I found this huge hole in the ground. If you see that there, there's this comb here on the side. Well, that was a yellow jacket nest that something, probably a raccoon, had dug up and had eaten all of the wasp larvae out. So not only do we rely on pollination, but we rely on the insects themselves because they provide a huge amount of protein for a lot of our mammals and birds as well. So now that I've emphasized just how important pollinators are, let's start talking about mosquitoes so that we can start connecting the dots here. So what steps can you take to minimize mosquitoes in your yard while protecting pollinators? Because nobody likes to go out and have mosquitoes buzzing around their heads and biting them and it's just uncomfortable and it's painful too, right? So I'm gonna talk about some of the non-chemical methods. So probably one of the most important things that you can do is reduce artificial mosquito habitat and practice source reduction. You're gonna hear the word source reduction quite a bit. So let's take a walk through my yard and see what kinds of things that we can find. So number one, bird bath. That's a huge culprit. Now Sydney had mentioned Asian tiger mosquitoes. They're probably our most common mosquito. Well, they tend to lay their larvae, to lay their eggs in man-made sources. So they don't tend to go to lakes and ponds. They try to find things like this, like a bird bath, and they can lay eggs in as little as one teaspoon of water. So what looks wrong to you about this bird bath? It's kind of grimy, it, water's been sitting there for a while. You can see there might be a little bit of algae building up there. Well, how about that? That looks a lot better, right? And in the chat, I had been seeing questions about, can I still leave out bowls of water for bees or for butterflies? Yes, you absolutely can. And you should of course leave out bird baths, but the trick is to change the water if not daily, then every other day. You don't wanna leave the water sitting so it becomes stagnant, so it collects debris. That's what's gonna attract mosquitoes. And your birds will be thankful to have fresh water. All right, so what else? Pet bowls, that's a really common one. Those collect debris, um, they can become stagnant as well. So the same idea, you wanna change the water, if not every day, then every few days to get some fresh water and your pets will be thankful as well. This is a good one because a lot of people don't pay attention to plants and to pots in their backyard, but these can accumulate quite a bit of water. So you wanna really target on that. And if you do see excess water, like in this pot right here, just tip it, drain it, and then keep on going. So what I try to do in my yard is I take little cycles, walks through my yard to make sure that there are things that aren't collecting water. Because it's amazing if you start to walk around how many different things collect water that you just weren't aware of. And again, it takes one teaspoon of water. That's all it takes for a mosquito to lay some eggs. Don't take a lot. So this pot right here, my kids were out collecting sticks and pine cones over the weekend. They left the bin just sitting there. 
it rained and there's a tiny little bit of water in the bottom. We didn't notice it because all the sticks and the pine cones were on top, but the mosquitoes notice it. So I always tip these kinds of containers over. Same for this bucket, just takes a little bit of water for mosquito to lay eggs in it. And then this is my favorite because I'm definitely guilty of this, the watering can. I'll go around watering my plants and for some reason there's always a tiny little bit of water and a little bit of debris left in the bottom and that's a really good spot for mosquito to lay their eggs. Another thing to mention also is that mosquitoes are responsible for heartworms in dogs. So if you try to do a good job getting rid of mosquitoes then hopefully you won't have to worry about heartworms in your dogs. Sydney had mentioned mosquito dunks. If there's a water source that's too large for you to change, I know somebody had mentioned um, horse troughs, it might be a little trickier to change. You can put mosquito dunks and that will eliminate the problem as well. But my personal opinion is I like to just put in fresh water as often as I can. So source reduction, that's a really huge preventative measure. So this picture basically just illustrates most of what I talked about. I wanted to mention clogged gutters. That's a really good way for water to get trapped and people don't notice it, especially if there's debris in the gutters. Um, rain barrels. Rain barrels are great because we were able to reuse water, but if you don't put a really fine mesh screening over the top of the barrel, then the mosquitoes can get in really easily. So you can go to Lowe's or Ace Hardware and get really fine mesh screening to cover the rain barrels and that should keep the mosquitoes out. So this is a really interesting unpublished study that was completed by a professor in Wilmington. And basically he just went out, him and some students, and looked at potential sites where water would collect, where mosquitoes might breed, kind of like what I was just talking about. And I thought that these numbers were just fun to look at because so many of these things are areas that we wouldn't even think about um, that would attract mosquitoes. So for instance, this tree holes, that was obviously pretty popular. Seven out of the eight tree holes that they looked at had mosquitoes. So one suggestion that this professor made was if you take some of that foam spray, you can put it into the tree hole and it expands and it conforms to the shape of that hole and water isn't able to collect in there anymore. Some of the things that I mentioned that had high numbers, plant dishes, 33 out of the 48 plant dishes that they looked at had mosquito eggs, bird baths, Tires is another one that I didn't mention. There's just all kinds of little places in your yard that water can collect and attract mosquitoes. So Cindy mentioned this briefly and there's some chatter about this as well in the chat about natural enemies. So if you have a healthy biological system, if you have a healthy wetland system, there are actually very few mosquitoes that you find in wetlands because there's so many natural predators, dragonflies, beetles, other insects, amphibians, bats, birds. Um, so it's a really effective way, and I'll talk about that in a minute, if you wanted to build a pond to potentially keep mosquitoes at bay. Bat houses, I think I dropped a link in the chat about um, some information on what type of bat house you can build, where to locate it. Brown bats can eat a lot of mosquitoes, but the thing about bats is that they're generalist feeders, right? So they love mosquitoes, but they love other insects too. Um, in addition to the fact that Asian tiger mosquitoes are active a lot during the day and bats aren't. So there's not gonna be that crossover. So while bats are a really good, um, predator, they're not going to eliminate your mosquito problem altogether. Um, purple martins are the same. They're insectivorous. They really enjoy mosquitoes, but they hunt at a really high elevation compared to mosquitoes that tend to stay down kind of low. So I'm not discouraging you from attracting those kinds of things to your yard because those are all really great wildlife to have in your yard, but just know that they're not going to completely eliminate your problem, but maybe coupled with really good source reduction and the natural enemies, that could really put a dent in your populations. Okay, so in your yard, Wear long sleeve shirts and long pants. If you choose insect repellent, this is a good website that has listed out some repellents that are considered safe and how to apply them. Me personally, if I'm out in my yard, I just cover myself from head to toe. I know when it's a July day and it's 98 degrees outside, that's not the best thing to do, but honestly, I just kind of have acclimated to it and I'd rather do that than put on bug spray. Um, if you're just sitting on your back porch, mosquitoes are very weak flyers, so you can put a box fan or some kind of fan and keep that on your porch or keep that on yourself and that should help as well. Um, and then if you have ground cover and I'm looking at all the non-native plant species like English ivy and pachysandra and other things that form that really dense kind of thicket because a lot of our native ground cover, they don't form necessarily that thick 
um, dense cover. If you thin out that English ivy or whatever is on the ground, that's gonna help too, because mosquitoes like those thick kind of moist-ish areas to hide out in. So if you don't give them a place to hide, they're gonna go find somewhere else. Um, I had mentioned building a pond. This is a great publication on how to do it. I put a question mark because you have to be really clever with how you build your pond. Because if you don't use the right plants and you don't use the right methodology, essentially you're kind of just creating this large uh, source of stagnant water. So if you're gonna do it, I think it's a great idea, but just make sure that you, proper, you follow some really good um, directions on how to do it and how to attract all those right predators to your yard to eliminate the mosquitoes. So. Um, I can drop this in the chat box again as well so that you have a chance to copy it down and take a look at this publication. It's very helpful. All right, so I'm going to try to end on um, community management plans. My suggestion would be to talk to some of your town leaders. If you're in an HOA, talk to the HOA leaders because really mosquitoes obviously don't know property lines, right? So you can do all of these great things in your yard, source reduction, um, you know, wear the proper clothing, thin out your ground cover. But if you have your next door neighbor and they have five tires and nasty old bird baths, you know, the mosquitoes are gonna come onto your property. So what I would do is I would talk to some of the community members, some of the town planners, some of the town council members in your particular town or your city and try to figure out a way to do these source reduction ideas on a larger scale. And so the essence of this document, which I have the website where you can find this document right down here, um, is to monitor and to find hotspots and the mosquito, mosquito species that really tend to spread the bad diseases. And so what they recommend is that you find those hotspots and you track the seasonal changes and look at what the surrounding community looks like if there are a lot of those natural predators. They also talk about disease surveillance, collecting actual mosquitoes to see if those are areas where there are high hotspots for disease. And also again, to look at the other wildlife in the vicinity. They talk a lot in this document about source reduction, how important it is on a broad level so that again, you're not just doing all this work just to have your neighbor's mosquitoes coming over and biting you nonstop. Um, public education, that's huge. I think we've talked about that quite a bit so that people know what they're dealing with, what they're battling. And then this idea of natural enemies creating and protecting these wetland areas. Because again, if you go out into a wetland and it's a healthy, sustainable community, you're not gonna find that many mosquitoes because there are dragonflies, there are frogs, there are lots of things that are naturally looking to eat mosquitoes. And so they're not gonna be that many present. So if you know how to correctly create, enhance or sustain that kind of habitat, you're gonna minimize the mosquitoes that you have. So steps moving forward. It takes a village. Again, talk to your neighbors about source reduction. Talk to your community leaders about source reduction. If you were spraying or spraying is happening around your house and neighborhood, what are some things that you can talk about with your neighbors? Sydney was talking about this briefly. Spray when the bees and the insects are less active, which is early in the morning, late in the afternoon. Spray when there's little or no winds. That's a huge one, so there's no drift. Spray when the bloom period is minimal, but again, even if there's no bloom, you still have to worry about all the caterpillars on the leaves, right? So ideally, you really want to think of an alternative where there's no spraying involved. And that's where those community management plans come in. There are several towns and cities across the country that have followed the ideology in those management plans and have really been able to knock back their mosquito population without doing this broad level spraying. They've done target spraying. They've targeted those hot spots where they have found this huge bulk of mosquitoes, but they've been able to avoid those massive aerial sprays where we see so many bee die-offs. So that is my last slide. I sped through that so quickly, but hopefully it was still uh, translatable. And with that, hopefully we have a little bit of time to take a few questions. And this is our contact information. I'll leave up this slide so that you can copy down our information if you have any questions for us after this webinar is over. Perfect, thank you both. That was amazing. And we do have a lot of questions and very little time, but if you guys have questions that we don't get to today, please feel free to reach out to either of our wonderful speakers. Um, so a uh, first question, which has come up a few times in the chat is from KK. And this person is saying, I very much worry about the essential oil, so-called natural organic formulae in use now. The vendors claim they are safe and maybe they are, are okay for hard bodies, adult insects 
but I suspect they may be 100% lethal to soft-bodied caterpillars. Can you comment on these formulae with respect to this issue? Yeah, so um, in terms of, you know, overall toxicology, as I had mentioned previously, unfortunately, um, I can't really speak too much on toxicology. So I couldn't exactly tell you the way that the essential oils would affect soft bodied insects, but that is something I absolutely will pass on to Beth Dittman, who is our division's toxicologist. And then maybe we can post a response on the NCPCA Facebook or maybe in the description of our YouTube posting for this recording or something like that. But um, I did kind of just briefly look up online while we were just on the call right now, just to kind of see if I could find any information. And it does look to me from a few kind of, you know, EDU type sources that um, essential oils would be effective as repellents or pesticides for, you know, soft bodied um, sort of larval forms. So things like caterpillars and things like that. So I would say most likely probably, but I will get back to you with a much better answer than that. Okay, great. I'll move on to the next one. What is the timeline for the cycle of life? And I believe that was for the mosquito. Ooh, the timeline, that's a good one. So um, it, is it the first few days, so they'll lay their eggs and they can hatch out within 24 hours. They come into their larval stages by kind of um, day two or so. And then beyond that, it really only takes them about seven days to kind of come into their adult life cycle. Um, but this is, again, going to be dependent upon the species of mosquito that you have. And then also it's dependent upon the environment. Um, if you're ever interested in looking up kind of how insects actually kind of progress into the next forms of their life cycle, um, definitely look up information about degree days because it's kind of based off of, you know, how hot is the area? You know, is the temperature going to slow down their life cycle progression or speed it up? So definitely look up more about degree days, but I won't bore you with that stuff right now. <laughs> great. Is there anything to add for Gabriella at all? Or... Okay. Okay, great. Um, we had a few questions about bats, which I think we covered with the resources sent over. And then we had some muddy water, small dish questions, which also pretty much got covered. Um, we do have a question from Carol who asked, can we get a review of the info about commercial applicators not being allowed to spray areas with the blooming flowers? Sure, so um, like I had kind of mentioned, this was the like super speedy version of this presentation. So I'm sorry because it was kind of disjointed, um, but the way that it works is that our department will take label language and um, you, based off of a regulation that we have that says that individuals cannot um, apply. Sorry, I keep getting distracted by the chat. I'm gonna just start over. I, like, I keep reading it and it's just getting me all caught up. Um, I apologize. So our regulation states that an individual cannot deviate from the pesticide label. And a lot of times in the environmental hazard section of a pesticide label, it will state that the product cannot be applied to blooming flowers where bees might go to forage. So when we're actually doing these types of investigations, our inspector will go out and primarily they will kind of test the area where the product was applied to see if we can kind of, you know, get sort of a picture overall of, you know, this area was the target area where the pesticide was applied. And then we'll also kind of consider pesticide drift. Um, if let's say they actually applied the blooming flowers and it comes back positive in our sample results, then we know for sure that they violated the pesticide label there. Um, there are also scenarios where the pesticide will kind of just drift. And so again, we'll kind of, um, you know, take samples, take photos. But if let's say they apply to a backyard where there are pollinators actively visiting the blooming flowers, then that's kind of, you know, how within the investigation we would assign a, a violation. Um, that's the briefest kind of description that I could give. I hope that that gave more information on it. Yeah, that was great. Um, and kind of just following up on that, if a commercial company is spraying in a tree above above blooming flowers, um, is that is that allowed? Is that not allowed? Well, 
So a lot of these mosquito fogging um, backpack sprayers, um, we went ahead and looked them up once and based off of kind of the throttle, if they were at full throttle um, being sprayed at full capacity, they potentially could reach 30 feet up into the air from the point of that backpack sprayer. So it's very possible that if they're spraying a into the trees and it's kind of got blooming flowers right below, then most likely I would say yes, they are probably going to be contacting those blooming flowers. Um, again, it kind of is based on the type of product that they're using. So does that label language exist on the product label? And then also, you know, are those flowers located within the backyard of the individual that asked for the treatment and is paying for them to be on site? Or is it, you know, somebody who's in the next yard over and it actually drifted and again would be an illegal application. So it's all very site specific. But if you ever have specific questions, you can always send me an email. We can talk about it. Great. Thank you, Sydney. Um, and I know we're at 206. We'll try to get to just a few more questions quickly. Um, and then any other questions can just follow up with our speakers. But um, going off of the last one, is there any requirement regarding inclement weather and application if there's a storm beforehand and someone sprays? So um, I would say the amount of moisture that's present doesn't really have anywhere that it fits within our regulations, but we do look at things like wind speed. Um, if let's say somebody made an application excuse me, and then there was a large storm that happened right afterwards, um, runoff could be an issue. And that is something that we certainly consider. But I would say if you know we're thinking about it before the application, that's not really something that's in our regulations. Um, a lot of times the pesticide label will actually also specify um, at what wind speeds you're able to apply a pesticide. Um, most of the time it'll say under 10 miles per hour, but again, it's kind of specific to the product. So what we would do is kind of pull up weather data from that day. And then we would also pull up the pesticide label and kind of compare the label language to the actual scenario. But we do see, especially in issues with like herbicide applications, which isn't exactly relevant to us today, but um, sometimes you'll see after a large rain that the herbicide actually washes out and through runoff, we see damage kind of wherever that pathway was. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Sydney. Um, we had a question about rain barrels and using dunks. Um, and I think that that was covered already. Um, we do have a neonicotinoid kind of two part question here. Um, so um, I keep seeing seeing posts about the neonics being used on garden center plants. So they will kill pollen. So they will kill pollinators for a little while after purchased or planted comments on that. And then do neonicotinoids affect the larvae of dragonflies? So um, I did try to kind of find a little bit about neonicotinoids and dragonflies online again while uh, Gabriella was speaking, but um, also not being a toxicologist, I just don't really want to make a comment on it um, just because I wasn't really find, able to find any kind of adequate information there. But I will certainly kind of talk to our toxicologist and see what she says about that question. Um, in terms of, you know, the situation with neonicotinoids being applied to nursery plants. So it is possible that they may have used neonicotinoids in kind of the growing stages of the plants um, before they actually made it out to retail nurseries. But I would say it is fairly uncommon, at least in North Carolina, for, you know, retail spaces like Home Depot or Lowe's, where they really are just purchasing plants that have already been grown, to kind of apply a pesticide after they've already been purchased. It's kind of more of a, they just want to retail, get it out to the consumer. Um, it's within the management decision of the grower whatever type of application that they might make. So it's really hard to say, but um, certainly it's something that you know, we can keep our eyes out for. We did have one scenario, which just might be kind of an interesting uh, thing that you might want to know about. Um, we had an individual who had applied pyreperoxifen, which is one of those larvicides that I mentioned earlier, to some um, nursery plants. And um, he also was 
supplying brood packages for hobbyist beekeepers out to individuals for sale. Um, when one of our sort of, I guess we call them complainants or people who call in complaints, received this brood, um, all, the brood almost completely died. And when we went and kind of looked around at the area, you know, what was actually applied, it turned out at this nearby nursery that, you know, there was a situation where they had applied this pyreperoxifen, you know, larvicide. So it is something that we see occasionally where in these specific instances, um, the bees will go out and they'll forage and they'll bring back something that is um, exposed and kind of contaminated with pesticides. But in terms of answering that question on a whole, I would say I'm, I'm sorry, but I can't really speak too much beyond just specifically what we got going on in North Carolina. That's great. And I'm just gonna get to two more questions and then we're gonna cut it off here. I know we have many questions in here, but this is a Gabriella specific question. Could you please repeat what nutrients bees get from the nectar and which from the pollen? Yes, so that's a really easy, quick question. From the nectar is carbohydrates and from the pollen it's um, protein and lipids essentially. Awesome, thank you. And then we have how, how do garlic based sprays impact pollinators? That is a great question. Again, it's kind of a toxicology question, so I can't really answer um, that one. But again, we'll kind of go ahead and ask the toxicologist and I can tell you what she says. Um, great. Also, uh, sorry to cut you off there, Tara. Um, saw a note that bleach will kill mosquito larvae. Um, it is possible, but as with anything that is a pesticide, which again, bleach is a pesticide, please be careful with your use of it. Um, you know. If you're putting it in an area, uh, don't, maybe go go lighter than heavier is what I would say. But again, you know, I'm, I'm not too sure about that one, but just be careful. Okay, great. Yeah, and we can just finish this up. I just, um, there's this one question that's kind of a concluding question. So which of the pesticides is the safest for bees, butterflies, and caterpillars? Um, so I guess this is kind of like a takeaway question on what we can all kind of gather from here. Should we... Is there one particular one that people can use or should we be going the non-pesticide route here? Mm, I don't know, Gabriella, do you wanna? Yeah, <laughs> so, so I'm, gonna, um, I'm gonna circle back to that community management plan because I really want to emphasize that, again, mosquitoes don't know property lines. And so it really has to be a community effort. And I think that there are some really good success stories from other cities and towns across the country, not little towns, but you know, um, Boulder and a city in New Jersey that they've been able to put in place this community management plan where they're doing a lot of surveys and targeting where the hotspots are um, and doing targeted treatments. And so I think with the outreach of people knowing about source reduction um, and this targeted, um, uh, targeted hotspot areas, I think that there's really a way to minimize how much pesticide you use. Because I think in backyards, you shouldn't have to use any. I don't want pesticides anywhere near my yard. I don't want to have to worry about my neighbor drifting their pesticide into mine. So in my opinion, ultimately, um, I don't think that any pesticide is safe for our pollinators because like I tried to mention in my presentation, they're everywhere. They're in all the nooks and crannies. So there's really no safe um, chemical that you can use. It's not going to affect some kind of beneficial insect somewhere. Um, but I guess, let me go ahead and wrap it up. So um, I put our contact information in the chat. It was on the screen. Please feel free to reach out to us. And I'm going to send out an email through Eventbrite to all the folks that registered when our presentation is posted online. If there are any other burning questions, send them to me. And I can also include them in that email I sent out to Eventbrite uh, registrants so that everybody can see the answers. That will hopefully be in the next week or so. So again, please feel free to reach out to us afterwards. Um, we're very grateful that you came. We're sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. We would have had to have done a three hour webinar, I think. But thanks so much to Sydney and to Tara and thanks to Debbie Roos for hosting us um, through Zoom through the NC Cooperative Extension. We're so appreciative for that. And with that, I think I'm gonna let everybody go since we're 15 minutes over our time. Thanks again, we appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>